Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for this Sunday morning service. Tusculum Hills Baptist Church is a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word. Well, today I want to speak to you about a very important topic. I'm going to talk about the Old and the New Covenants. And I will be speaking out of Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Many people are confused by the Bible. You ever heard someone say, I just don't understand it, I'm just confused by it, and they use that as an excuse, uh, like a form of denial to, to not read the Bible and to not be involved in the work of the church. I don't understand the Bible. Um, the Old Testament and the New Testament, people will say, seem so different. And they are very different. <clears throat> People get hung up in the Old Testament and then they just put it aside, not really understanding what it is about. And it is indeed a complex book. Uh, it's not a book for amateurs. Some may see it as a, a vague book uh, interspersed with interesting narratives like the creation story, the, the crossing of the Red Sea, uh, Joseph, Noah, uh, Samson and Delilah, David and Goliath, and so on. And it's, it's easy for us to skip entire books of the Old Testament just because they are difficult to understand. But probably the main reason that people give up on the Old Testament is because they do not understand the way of life for followers of God in the Old Testament. Believers in that day had a very, very different lifestyle than we have today. They worshiped the same God, but they did worship Him in a different way. So they were under the old covenant, or as a friend of mine calls it, the first covenant. Today we are in the new covenant, or the second covenant. Now covenants in the Bible, there were two different types of covenants in the Bible. There were bargaining covenants, then there were non-bargaining covenants. And I want you to, to remember this and, and listen carefully as I explain this because this will set the foundation for the rest of the message this morning. Agreements between people, ag agreements between equals or between a, uh, a, a, a lord and the indentured servant, these were bargaining covenants or agreements between two parties where the terms are hashed out between the two parties and agreed upon. Then there was the non-bargaining covenant or agreement. Uh, in the non-bargaining covenant, you either accept it or you don't. Some of you have covenants in your neighborhood. I believe that's what they're called, codes. And when you move into a neighborhood, you have to agree to the covenant. If you don't want the, to agree to the covenant, then you don't move into the neighborhood. Now, normally in a non-bargaining covenant, the lesser party is obligated to the greater party. The one with the most power is the one that has the leverage and obligates the lesser party. But with God's covenants, we see something completely different. In fact, we see the complete opposite. You see, God's covenants with man are non-bargaining covenants. We either accept them or we reject them. We're not able to bargain with God and work out the terms. But the interesting thing is, is that he, being the much greater party, obligates himself on behalf of the lesser party. God made a covenant with Noah. God made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with Moses. He made a covenant with David, and each time, he, being the much greater party, obligated himself to people. Now, also, God made a covenant with a whole nation of people. He promised to make them a great nation. And along with this, he gave them an extensive number of laws to live by. These laws were the way of salvation for the people in this day. They had to learn the laws. They had to live by these laws. They were so engaged in the law that they went to bed 
quoting the law. They got up quoting the law. They went throughout the whole day quoting the law. Now, there were many laws, but to, today we lump them together and call them the law, the Old Testament law. The law involved complicated cleansing rituals, physical cleansing. You didn't just go pray. You didn't just go to the temple. You went through a cleansing ritual, making yourself physically clean on the outside before you approached God. These complicated rituals involved the sacrificing of animals. They also had complicated dietary laws and other health laws. The book of Leviticus explains these laws as well as some other books, but Leviticus also explains the sacrificial system. There was the burnt offering. This was a whole animal that was sacrificed, explained in chapter 1 of Leviticus. Then there is the, the peace offering. This was an unblemished animal that was part of a peace offering, chapter 3 of Leviticus. Then there was the, the purification offering. This was a, a bull, a goat, a lamb, doves, or pigeons, depending on the type of sin that was committed and the purification that needed to happen. That's in chapter 4 of Leviticus. And then there was a, the reparation offering. This was a ram in chapter 5 of Leviticus. Then there was even a wave offering, just like this, a wave offering. This was an offering of grain. This was uh, an offering that was uh, intended as a solemn presentation to God. In other words, people literally would take up this grain and they would do this as a solemn presentation to God. And then portions of these offerings went to the priest. And this is how the priest was paid. This is how the priest was fed. The, the priests were a necessity. The priest was the mediator between God and man. Now what I'm telling you is very important. This is basic working knowledge that I'm giving you of the purpose of the Old Testament and the, the, the meaning of the Old Covenant. All of these things I just talked to you about, all of these things were wrapped up in the way of salvation for the, for the people of old. And today we are free from all of that because of Christ. Jesus fulfilled the law. And when he fulfilled the law, he brought in a new covenant. This is why the Old Testament is so complicated to most of us. It's because we are on this side of the cross and we see things differently. God has blessed us in a different way. The old law was good. The old, the old covenant was good. The new covenant is better, according to the scripture in Hebrews. And this morning, I want to look at the old and new covenants as explained in the book of Hebrews. Look with me at chapter 4, starting with verse 14. The scripture says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, I want you to listen as I compare and contrast the old covenant and the new covenant, of which we're a part of today. I'm going to go through quite a few scriptures here in Hebrews. And if, if you want my notes from this message for your own study, I'll be glad to provide them for you. Listen to this about the old covenant. First of all, the old covenant was incomplete. Hebrews 8 verse 7 says, For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. It was an incomplete covenant. You see that the purpose of the incomplete covenant was not because God didn't think of all the details. It was because it pointed out the need for a Messiah. See, rules and laws were not enough. The people needed a Messiah. 
The old covenant was incomplete. The new covenant is complete. Hebrews chapter 10, 11 and 12 says this, But when this priest, meaning Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus' atonement, Jesus' sacrifice for our sins completed the covenant. Well, the old covenant was also conditional. Hebrews 8, chapter 9. The Lord said that it would, it would not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. So there was lots of rules God expected his people to go by. He obligated himself to his people as long as they followed the rules. There were conditions. Listen to this though. The new covenant is unconditional. The next verse there, verse 10 says, This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. The old covenant was external. Hebrews 9 verse 13 says this, The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. But the new covenant is internal. Hebrews 9 10 says, they are only a matter of food and drink, the laws. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial, ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order, meaning the new covenant. The old covenant gave indirect access to God. Hebrews chapter 8 verse, verse 11 says, No longer will they teach their neighbor... Or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. During this indirect, this time of indirect access to God, people had to go to a priest. Now, how many of you would like would, would prefer coming to me before you could get to God? Or in order to get to God? You wouldn't like that. You wouldn't want to come and tell me your sins. You would not want to come and bring an unblemished animal for me to sacrifice or, or, or help you sacrifice. You would not want me partnered with you and your relationship with God. But that's exactly what it was like with these people of old. They had to be in good with the priest. They couldn't badmouth the priest. There really wasn't any option there. Now... The new covenant gives direct access to God. Hebrews 9.11 says, But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that's not made with human hands, that is to say, is not part of this creation. It's a spiritual world. It's a spiritual tabernacle. It's one that we can't see. I've often heard people tell children, don't run in God's house. Well, let me tell you, God does not live in this building. The better thing to say is don't run in church. Because under the new covenant, this is the temple of God. You're the temple of God. It's not a building that was created and during this Old Testament time, under the Old Covenant, there was a temple. And the temple did not have pews in it like this. Uh, it did not have a pulpit for someone to preach. It was set up very differently than what we can even imagine. I need to show you a, a drawing of it sometime. But there were different stations for different reasons, different sacrificing, different areas to sacrifice, different, different places for uh, ceremonial washings. And in the back part of the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies. And inside the Holy of Holies, there was this, this, this big uh, 
piece of furniture called the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were some special things, but the main thing about the Ark of the Covenant is that was where God's Holy Spirit lived. He was right there. They didn't touch the Ark of the Covenant because if they did, they would die. God's presence was so great. So they devised ways with poles to carry the Ark of the Covenant when they moved. They were carrying God's Spirit from one place to the next. Now, we don't have that today. Why? Because God's Spirit is where? Everywhere. We don't have God, or God doesn't have Himself confined to the Ark of the Covenant. And wherever the Ark of the Covenant is today, it's a piece of furniture. Because God's Spirit does not dwell there in the way that He did in this day. Now, the Old Covenant remembered sin. Hebrews 10, 11 says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So in that day, so long ago, sins were rolled forward to the time of the Messiah. In other words, the people had hoped that someday their sins would be forgiven by the Messiah. Now think about it. Back then when people died, they died hoping in faith that the Messiah would come someday and free them from all the sins they had committed. They didn't live to see the Messiah. They had faith that it was going to happen someday. Yet, if they were current on their sacrifices, their sins were in total, in total ro rolled forward to the cross. Do you understand the picture that I'm giving you here? A completely different way of thinking, a different way of approaching God. But the new covenant forgets sin. Hebrews 8.12 says, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now the old covenant is obsolete. There's a lot of people trying to live by the old covenant today. To please God. To earn some points with God in some way. But the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 8.13, By calling the covenant new... He has made the first one obsolete. What is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. The new covenant, though, is not obsolete. It never goes out of style. It's always in fashion. The new covenant is current. The new covenant is final. There won't be another covenant. Hebrews 10.10 says, And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant that the covenant had been wrapped up and that people right now were free from their sins if they would merely confess their sins and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Can you imagine the difference that happened in this day? When Jesus was on earth and in the New Testament, we see where the Jews, many Jews, believed and rejoiced that Jesus was the Messiah. Now can you imagine having one lifestyle, hoping for the Messiah, living through all these laws and rituals, and then all of a sudden you realize He is the Messiah. And I no longer have to do any of this. In fact, my sins aren't rolled forward anymore. My sins have been forgiven. What a wonderful thing to have been living in that day for it to have happened in that day. But how much more wonderful is it for us to live today and look back when it happened? You see, we won't be like the people of the Old Testament, dying, hoping that someday this Messiah will come and forgive us of our sins. We look back. We have the Bible, the historical record, that tells us that it happened. And we know from personal experience that Jesus is the Savior. Now, the Old Covenant had an earthly tabernacle. Hebrews 9.1 says, Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. The new covenant is spiritual 
Hebrews 9, 11 says, But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, not part of this creation. The old covenant was symbolic. You see, it was in a temple, housed in a temple, the old covenant that was explained to people had them doing things literal with their hands, yet it was symbolic. Hebrews 9.9 9 says this is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They went through the ritual, but the scripture says their conscience wasn't really cleared. Why? Because the old covenant only foreshadowed the future Messiah. So the new covenant is not symbolic. The new covenant is actual, even though it's not caught up in things that we do with our hands and rituals that we fulfill or do. Hebrews 9, chat, uh, chat verses 10 through 12 say, He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Redemption is no longer symbolic. It really happens. The old covenant required animal sacrifices. Note the, note the plural, sacrifices. I just read about goats, bulls, heifers, doves, and pigeons. And we felt, what we fail to realize is that the entire lifestyle and culture of the believers of the Old Testament revolved around the temple and the sacrificial system every day. The temple had lines of people waiting for the priest to help them make a sacrifice to get forgiveness of their sins. This was the way people worshipped. There was no alternative to attend another temple because someone wanted to worship in a different way. There were no options between traditional temple and contemporary temple. There were no arguments about whether to fire the priest and hire a new one. It was the way it was. To be forgiven, people just didn't bow their heads and ask for forgiveness. They had to make a sacrifice. And then once per year, there was the Day of Atonement. The priest sacrificed a bull for his own sins and cleansed himself for his own sins. And then he took two goats, one that was sacrificed, and his, the, the blood of the goat was sprinkled on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. And then the other goat was called a scapegoat. And the priest put his hands on the head of the scapegoat and confessed the sins of Israel to the scapegoat. And then the scapegoat was turned loose. That's where we get the word scapegoat today, when somebody gets the blame for something they didn't do. The scapegoat got the blame for the people's sins, even though the goat had done nothing. You might say, how cruel. But think about it, not really. How gracious. Since people should die for their sins, God in his grace provided a way out. An animal could die as a substitute for a person's sin. I wonder if we had to go to the priest today and offer a sacrifice each time we sinned, would we sin less? I wonder if the sacrificial system was so commonplace that no one really thought that much about it. Oh well, I just sinned, so let me go find a, a fatted calf and sacrifice it along with the priest's help in order to be forgiven. Did it become so ingrained in their lifestyle that it became mundane? We, what we do know from numerous Old Testament scriptures is that the people longed for the Messiah, even though they didn't fully understand all the Messiah would do for them, such as radically change the way people lived from day to day. We have an alarm that wakes us up. Or maybe some of you wake up without an alarm. We go about our business throughout the day, planning it the way we want to plan, or maybe someone else has planned our day for us, but we've got a routine that we follow. We have a high degree of freedom for what, of what we do. But in this day, the people did not have that. 
everything centered around this sacrificial system over and over and over and over. So the old covenant required animal sacrifices. The new covenant required one human sacrifice. Amen. Hebrews 9 verse 12 says, He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered a most highly holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. You see, Jesus is the new covenant. The sacrificing of animals for forgiveness of sin is no longer necessary. Hebrews 1.3 says that when he made a purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. When Jesus said to Telestai, it is finished on the cross, we have absolutely no idea of all the pain and agony that he suffered. His suffering on the cross was the one and only sacrifice for all time so that any man, any woman, any boy, any girl, at any time in history of the world, past, present, or future could be forgiven of sins. The eternity that we should spend in hell, Jesus took on the cross. All of the sacrifices of the Old Testament by millions of people with millions and millions of animals for billions and trillions of sins. All of these sins were rolled forward and every one of them were accounted for on the cross. The old covenant was powerless to save from sin. As the scripture says in Hebrews 10, 4, for it is not possible <coughs> that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. But the new covenant saves from sin. Hebrews 7, 25, therefore he is able to save those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Again, the old covenant was powerless to save from sin, but the new covenant saves from sin. Now, in the same way, I tend to believe that people of the old took for granted God's mercy through the sacrificial system. I believe that we take for granted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Probably even more so. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 28 says, Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace. People, we are living in the better covenant. We are on this side of the cross. And if anybody here thinks you've got it hard, Think about the people under the old covenant whose lives were totally consumed every day with this sacrificial system that never really forgave their sins, just rolled them forward. So let us not take the new covenant lightly. Let us not take living in the new covenant lightly. Let us not take the blood of Christ lightly. One sacrifice by one Savior that forgave all the sins of all people of all time to those who will receive it. Because under God's non-negotiable covenant in the old covenant and in the new covenant, you either accept it or you reject it. Because God wants no unwilling recruits. He wants people who accept it. Let's bow our heads.